Uh, the hearing will come to order. Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to consider the nomination of Lieutenant General Stephen Nordhaus for promotion to general and to be the chief of the National Guard Bureau, and the nomination of Vice Admiral Alvin Holsey for promotion to admiral and to be commander of U.S. Southern Command. General Nordhaus, congratulations on your nomination. I would like to thank your family and loved ones who have supported your service and are proudly watching right now. Admiral Holsey, I would like to welcome your wife, Stephanie, thank you, and your son, Jordan, soon to be Dr. Holsley, and also recognize that your eldest son, Lieutenant Commander Select, Joshua Holsey, could not be here today because he's preparing for an upcoming deployment. We thank him for his service and wish him luck. Thank you. Let me also recognize the outgoing leaders at the National Guard Bureau and Southern Command, General Daniel Hokinson, recently retired as Chief of the National Guard Bureau after 38 years of distinguished service to the nation. General Hokinson led the National Guard through one of the most consequential periods in its history, and we are grateful for his steady hand. I would also like to thank General Laura Richardson as she prepares for retirement after nearly four decades in the Army. She has led Southern Command with skill and distinction, and our forces there are partially for success thanks to her leadership. General Nordhaus, you are well qualified to serve as Chief of the National Guard Bureau, or NGB. A fighter pilot by training, you have led airmen and soldiers at every level, including in your current post as Commander of Continental U.S. NORAD and previous command of First Air Force and leadership as Director of Operations and Logistics for the NGB Joint Staff. If confirmed, you will serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff as the Principal Advisor of the Secretary of Defense and the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Air Force on matters related to the National Guard. This is a challenging but important time for the National Guard. The Guard has always been our military's core combat reserve force, especially over the past two decades and its warfighting capabilities will continue to be relied upon. Right now, there are tens of thousands of National Guard soldiers and airmen mobilized around the world carrying out vital missions. At the same time, the National Guard's role on American soil is also more important than ever, and its leaders must be thoughtful about how the force is used and resourced. In particular, the National Guard's civil support missions are becoming more complicated. Responding to natural disasters such as hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, and flooding, as well as health and humanitarian crises like COVID-19, often require the skills, manpower, and logistics that only the National Guard can provide. Such challenges will continue to strain local communities and authorities, and the National Guard will have a critical role to play in responding to them. General Nordhaus, I would like to know your thoughts on the proper employment and limits of using the National Guard in support of civilian authorities, including when it is operating in either a state or federal status. In addition, you will be responsible for improving the National Guard's recruiting and retention strategies. The Guard has fared better than the active components in this regard, but the recruiting environment continues to be historically challenging. I would like to know how you would address this issue, especially with regard to retaining highly skilled personnel with transferable civilian training. Turning to Southern Command, Admiral Holsey, you bring 36 years of experience as a naval aviator to this position. You have served at sea and ashore across the globe and at every level of leadership. Your current position is military deputy commander of SOUTHCOM and previous experience, including as commander of Carrier Strike Group 1, will serve you well. If confirmed as commander of SOUTHCOM, you will be facing growing challenges from China and Russia in Latin America. The political and economic instability in the region presents a situation that our adversaries are seeking to exploit to increase their own influence. China, in particular, is expanding its presence in the region, including through investments in strategic infrastructure, such as the Port of Balboa in Panama, 5G telecommunications, and an expanding network of space tracking installations. Admiral, I'm interested in your assessment of the challenge from near-peer competitors in Latin America and how we might work strategically with our partners in the region to build resilience against these activities. Further, we know that violence and economic problems are contributing to the instability in the SOUTHCOM area of responsibility. In particular, Venezuela's President Maduro's failure to provide transparency following the July general election has thrown his nation into greater political and economic chaos. And earlier this spring, 
the deteriorating security conditions in Haiti prompted the U.S. forces to augment security at the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince and evacuate non-essential personnel. Finally, transnational criminal activity and corruption continue to harm other areas, especially, especially in the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Admiral, I would like to know your views on what more can be done to help improve the situation and strengthen security throughout the region. Gentlemen, these complex challenges will require the full complement of your skills. Thank you for your willingness to continue your service and lead the nation, particularly the National Guard and Southcom at this critical moment. I look forward to your testimonies. Let me now recognize Ranking Member Senator Wicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, you've already recognized family members, but I do want to congratulate Vice Admiral Holsey on uh, persuading a young lady from Claiborne County to be his bride some years ago. Um, Admiral Halsey, uh, as the Deputy Commander at Southcom, you know as well as anyone how effective the Chinese Communist Party has become in the region. The CCP has been engaging in predatory economic and diplomatic practices in the region, threatening our interests there. Our neighbors to the South rightly seek economic security for their people. The Chinese exploit this goal by aggressively lobbying leaders across the hemisphere, peddling dubious promises of infrastructure, um, local job creation. Instead of honoring their promises, they often follow through with predatory practices. The CCP le leaves those nations worse off by constructing infrastructure exclusively with Chinese labor and by creating facilities that are either poorly built or incomplete. Simultaneously, through its state-owned enterprises, China sets conditions to enhance its military presence, gather intelligence, and attempt to limit U.S. access and influence. This July, the Center for Strategic and International Studies published a report in which they outlined no fewer than four separate Chinese electronic surveillance operations on the island of Cuba. These operations may even be able to collect signals, intelligence, well into U.S. territory. Um, this summer, the Russian Navy sent warships and submarines to exercise with the Cuban Navy. In other words, great power competition is happening right here in the Americas. Now is the time for us to enhance our relationships and economic investment with our southern neighbors. Yet our current approach is failing. Southcom has continued to rely primarily on security assistance and cooperation, which is prohibitively expensive. It's time to use capital investments to achieve national security goals in this theater. Traditionally, we have not thought of investment strategy as a tool in DOD's belt but it can be highly effective when properly employed. And you and I have discussed this. We should use it more frequently to promote U.S. influence and defense interests, and Southcom can lead the way. It should work with entities such as the DOD's Office of Strategic Capital, the Development Finance Corporation, and the Export-Import Bank. Their collaboration could pair U.S. private capital with strategic investment opportunities in the region yielding economic and national security benefits for the United States. Admiral Hosey, I look forward to hearing how you intend to change Southcom's approach so it can do a better job of countering the malign influence of our adversaries and expand U.S. credibility in the region. Now, Lieutenant General uh, Nordhaus, if confirmed to serve as the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, you will be the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Defense on National Guard matters. The National Guard experiences constant tension between its federal and state missions. The federal government provides the vast majority of funds for the National Guard, and it's entitled to set the terms and conditions for how those resources, resources are used. In addition, the National Guard performs vital tasks for local communities, but these services cannot come at the expense of the Guard's military readiness responsibilities. If confirmed, perhaps your most challenging task will be striking a balance between these often competing federal and state missions. 
These competing priorities have led to avoidable conflict only recently. The National Guard cannot be the solution to every local labor shortage. In two extreme examples, some governors have used the National Guard to drive school buses and staff nursing homes. These decisions erode military readiness and they improperly take service members away from their families and their civilian employment, not to mention their uh, uh, statutory mission. If confirmed, I expect you to use your influence to ensure the National Guard personnel are properly focused on readiness and used appropriately to support the Department of Defense and our nation in times of emergency or conflict. Uh, finally, I would like to congratulate the 155th Armored Brigade Combat Team of the Mississippi Army National Guard on a successful deployment. They took command of the Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine, located in Germany, and had responsibility, uh, responsibility for training and mentoring the Ukrainian armed forces. This mission remains critical to our national security, and I'm proud of the Mississippi National Guard for um, conducting such an important role, and I felt I should mention it this morning. So thank both of you for being here. I look forward to a very interesting hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Wicker. Uh, General Nordhaus, you are recognized. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee, I am truly honored to be here and thank you for your longstanding support of the mission and men and women of the National Guard. I also want to thank President Biden, Secretary Austin, and General Brown for their trust and confidence in nominating me to be the next chief of the National Guard Bureau. I am privileged to testify alongside Vice Admiral Halsey, an incredible officer and teammate. I'd also like to recognize General Hokinson and his wife Kelly for their enduring impact they left on the National Guard. I would not be here today if it were not for my family. And I would like to recognize them for their sacrifices they've made to allow me to do what I love. My wife Shannon is the love of my life, the rock of our family, and my faithful spouse for over 35 years. Her commitment and advocacy for family and soldiers and airmen who serve has been nothing short of amazing. Together we have five children, six grandchildren, and 430,000 guardsmen we consider family. Shannon is the oldest daughter of Paul and Brenda Lawrence. Paul is a retired air traffic controller who served in Southeast Asia during Vietnam. My father, Don, served in the Navy. He, along with my mom, Sandy, are responsible for my passion and love of flying and joining the Air Force. Our son, Clay, is a captain in the Space Force, and the others are patriots in their own way. Whitney is the oldest, and Luke are working within their communities. Our twins, Noah and Austin, are currently attending college, studying business and music at the universities of Dayton and Michigan. Over the past 35 years, I've been shaped by incredible leaders and service members who I've served with at home and abroad during multiple US and coalition deployments. I've held five commands, served at NORAD and US Northcom and on the NGB staff as Director of Ops and Logistics. I have served both in the active duty and the National Guard as a traditional guardsman, a temporary technician, and an active guardsman. These unique leadership experiences have made me acutely aware of the security challenges we face and the tough decisions ahead. I come to you today at an important time in our nation's history, with the rise of strategic competitors, a complex geopolitical environment, and roughly 42,000 National Guard soldiers and airmen engaged globally. We face persistent threats both in the homeland and abroad, and the next Chief of the National Guard Bureau must work closely with the 54 states, territories in the District of Columbia, as well as with the services, the Joint Force, and our allies and partners to meet these challenges. In this vein, I believe the State Partnership Program is critical to our success and makes us stronger together and stronger tomorrow. If confirmed, I will ensure the National Guard airmen and soldiers are manned, trained, and equipped to continue to meet any mission anywhere. I will work tirelessly with this committee and all the stakeholders to defend our nation. I firmly believe the National Guard is an elite and ready warfighting force, serving as the primary combat reserve to the United States Army and Air Force, providing robust capability, capacity, and strategic and operational depth. This investment serves as a force multiplier, enabling the National Guard to concurrently respond to our community's needs while serving under the control of the governors 
and the military needs during times of conflict. You have my solemn promise to maintain an open line of communication with this committee and Congress. For the last 388 years, the incredible men and women of the National Guard have risen to every challenge and proven themselves on the battlefield and in our communities. They are and always will be my highest priority. They must balance their military careers, their family careers, their civilian careers, so we can keep our promise as Americans to be always ready and always there. In closing, I would like to thank you again for this opportunity to be before this committee. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, Admiral Holsey, please. Chairman Reed, Wanker Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored and humbled to appear before you today as the nominee to lead United States Southern Command. I'd like to thank President Biden, Secretary Austin, and General Brown for their trust and confidence. I'm honored to testify alongside Lieutenant General Norhouse as the National Guard State Partnership Program is a key enabler when it comes to building partner national capability and capacity throughout the region. I'd also like to recognize and thank General Richardson, the current SOUTHCOM commander, and her husband Jim for their loyal and dedicated 70 plus years of service to our nation. General Richardson got us to SOUTHCOM and the impact she has made in the region has been inspiring. If confirmed, I will build on our efforts and work across the whole of government, our allies and partners to ensure we address security challenges and expand opportunities to truly realize SOUTHCOM's vision of a secure, free and prosperous Western Hemisphere. I'd like to thank my family for their love and support throughout my military career. With me today is my wife of 34 years, Stephanie, and our young son, Jordan. Stephanie is my best friend, a wonderful mother, an educator turned dentist who has practiced in five states based off of multiple moves as a family. Our oldest son, Joshua, cannot be here today. He's charting his own path in naval aviation and is preparing for an upcoming deployment. Together, we have a combined 45 years of service and I like to think that we've made a difference. Jordan is in his third year at the University of Virginia Medical School, conducting his clinicals at Nova Fairfax. I cannot be prouder of the young men they have become. I also like to thank my parents, the late Charles Holsey Sr., an engineer, and my mother, Rosa Holsey, a retired educator. They raised four sons and taught us the importance of faith, family, education, and service. My father served in the Army during the Korean War, and his three brothers all served in the Navy. Go Navy. The three of my mother's four brothers served in the Army during Vietnam. Service is not just what we do, it is who we are as a family. My first deployment to SOFCOM Air Responsibility was over 33 years ago, conducting counter-drug missions flying off a Knox-class frigate. But this region, our neighborhood, is so much more. It's on the front line of strategic competition. Most focus to the east and west when they think of great power competition, but a look to our south reveals that our adversaries have established a strong presence, jeopardizing security, stability across the Americas. The PRC and Russia are strategic competitors who seek to undermine democracy while gaining power and influence in the region. Transnational criminal organizations create and exploit the permissive environment, undermining the rule of law and disrupting legitimate government functions. Additionally, transboundary threats demand our attention as well, from irregular migration, climate change, eroding democracies, to food and water insecurities. Our time is now. If we don't take deliberate and meaningful steps over the next five to 10 years, this region will change forever. To be clear, partnerships are our best deterrents to countering shared security and economic concerns. And for now, we remain the trusted partner, but we can't take that for granted. Over the past 19 months as a deputy commander, I've personally seen the importance of our enduring presence in the region. And our partners seek us as an alternative to the PRC, Russia, and others. Rapidly responding to crisis is not just a phrase in our mission statement. Over the past several years, SOFCOM has responded, and we will respond again to earthquakes, floods, wildfires, volcanoes, hurricanes, and droughts. To be a trusted partner, we must be credible, present, and engaged. Our main campaigning tool in this region is security cooperation. If confirmed, I'll work tirelessly with our partners to understand their requirements, then work across the whole of government to deliver at the point of need and build partner nation capability and capacity to respond to our shared threats in our neighborhood. I also look forward, if confirmed, to working with Congress who are central partners in the defense of our nation. Thank you again, Chairman Reed, 
Ranking Member Wicker, members of the committee for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I have a series of questions required of all nominees. You may answer in unison. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? Yes. Have you assumed any duties or taken any actions that would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? No. no. Exercising our legislative and oversight responsibilities makes it important that this committee, its subcommittees, and other appropriate committees of Congress receive testimony, briefings, reports, records, and other information from the executive branch on a timely basis. Do you agree, if confirmed, to appear and testify before this committee when requested? Yes. yes. Do you agree when asked before this committee to give your personal views, even if your views differ from the administration? Yes. Do you agree to provide records, documents, and electronic communications in a timely manner when requested by this committee, its subcommittees, or other appropriate committees of Congress, and to consult with the requester regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial in providing such records? Yes. yes. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established by this committee for the production of reports, records, and other information, including timely responding to hearing questions for the record? Yes. yes. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional requests? Yes. yes. Will those witnesses and briefings briefers be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Admiral Hosey, could you give a brief outline of South Gums? current uh, priorities and initiatives to counter the acute threat of Russia and China and other uh, malign combinations? Yes, sir. You might bring that microphone a little forward, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, for the uh, current uh, priorities are to strengthen partnerships, counter threats, and to build our team. So as you look at the Southcom AOR, Strategic competition is real. As I mentioned, the uh, PRC and Russia continue to try to undermine democracy and seek to gain power and influence in the region. When I look at the transnational criminal organizations, uh, they continue to uh, create chaos throughout the region. The transnational criminal organizations and the violent extremist organizations remain the primary threat to uh, instability in the region. Uh, you also have the uh, third of their funding that they take in each year is um, uh, kind of drug mission from uh, uh, drug, uh, drug ops or illicit drugs. So we're watching that very closely. Then finally, I'm concerned about the uh, unrest in Haiti, um, uh, Venezuela, and Cuba as it stands right now. That also contributes to the irregular migration we're seeing. And uh, in particular with respect to Russia and Chinese influence? Uh, as yes, we sir. Vote. So with regard to uh, Russia, uh, China first. Uh, China remains a long-term strategic competitor. They're a pacing challenge, and they're setting the theater. Uh, in my view, uh, a PRC approach to the region is primarily driven by economics, which provides access, influence, and the opportunity to coerce our partner nations into unfavorable terms. Uh, in short, they see unchecked opportunity. I think they're playing the long view to um, uh, using economic statecraft to advance their foreign policy goals. So that's the, the quick piece there with, from an economic side. But it's more than that. Uh, I think their efforts to develop and, and uh, build uh, dual-use sites and facilities uh, in the region is concerning, from uh, space and labor infrastructure to uh, ports and uh, 5G infrastructure as well. Uh, from a Russia standpoint, they're a more uh, acute challenge. Uh, they seek to undermine democracy. Uh, they uh, like to compete with the United States, I believe, on a uh, global scale. And they look for low-cost opportunities to exert their influence and, and take advantage of the chaos in the region uh, to uh, build their partnerships and undermine ours. They generally look to, uh, again, maintain partnerships. They seek to provide presence, and they try to shape their information space. So all that's very challenging. I think we get after that, sir, uh, through our security cooperation, our partnerships, uh, working the whole of government to make sure we can stay on the field and engage. Thank you very much. Uh, General Nordhaus, uh, you have uh, been at every level of service in, in, in the National Guard and, in, and with the Air Force. Can you give us uh, sort of your lessons learned from the n numerous post-9-11 contingency operations that the, the Guard has been assigned? And they've carried them out magnificently. I was a few uh, 
months ago in Kosovo with my National Guard as they are fulfilling their mission. So the lessons you think are most critical. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the National Guard and our uh, airmen and soldiers are completely integrated and interoperable with our active Army and Air Force. And uh, that lesson, as we look into the future, uh, needs to continue. Um, as we look at priorities, as I go forward, if confirmed, um, our people are the most critical. So recruiting and retention and making sure that we have those and continue that. The lessons learned there to make sure that we always have our uh, force structure full, organized, trained, equipped to be that combat reserve to the Army and the Air Force. Uh, then really readiness. I think readiness is something that we have to continue to build. And as we look at great power competition uh, that we're in, we have to accelerate that and make sure that uh, readiness for our airmen and our soldiers are ready to be deployable, interoperable, and sustainable. And then the partnerships uh, that you mentioned. As we look at the 106 state partners uh, around the globe today, those partnerships are critical and are uh, asymmetric advantage for our nation. And then modernization. Uh, we need to stay concurrent uh, with modernization with our services so that we can always uh, be ready and there for them. Well, thank you very much, General. Uh, thank you both for your service to the nation. Uh, Senator Worker, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Hosey, in my opening statement, I mentioned how prohibitively expensive security assistance in, um, is um, in, in the region and suggested um, other ways in which we could uh, uh, perhaps emphasize uh, our friendship and strengthen our ties with um, our friends in SOUTHCOM. I mentioned um, Office of Strategic Capital Development Finance Corporation and the Export Import Bank. Um, do you agree, and what do you think about that? Uh, Senator, I actually do absolutely agree. Uh, economic security is national security. And what we're seeing from my partners, uh, we have to be able to respond at the point of need, at the point of relevance. And so we're, we're realizing as we work through the, the foreign military sales, foreign military financing process, it can be slow at times. So we're looking for opportunities in some countries or high in, income countries. And so we're trying to find ways to deliver quicker. So we are exploring right now with uh, Exim Bank. Uh, we we'll get a chance to go out to the uh, Inter America Inter Development Bank and other opportunities we're looking at, uh, looking at uh, uh, talking to uh, American Chamber of Commerce. So we're trying to get our story out there and kind of get the synergy with our partners to understand that here's opportunities for you to actually go after. So we're really uh, pressing real hard on that. We'll continue to do so, sir, if confirmed. Um, okay, you, you talked about us being the the trusted partner in, uh, in the great majority of uh, the nations in Southcom. And I think you, you mentioned three uh, particular areas where there's a problem that, of course, would be Cuba, Venezuela, and I believe you said Haiti. Um, in, in the other countries other than those three, it, isn't it a fact that even though we are the trusted partner, uh, the People's Republic of China is right in there, um, paying for infrastructure, spreading their money around. Um, and it, it, is, is that correct? Am I correct in that? And uh, if you could elaborate on that for us, please. So, Senator, Senator the PRC continues to, um, it, right now you have 22 countries of 31 who are signatories of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so what they do with the Belt and Road, Belt and Road Initiative, they portray that as expanding economic, financial, and trade opportunities. I think we see it a bit differently. Uh, I think by the time our countries realize they've been deceived, they find themselves with more debt, uh, high interest rate loans, uh, poorly constructed infrastructure projects, uh, data insecurity, uh, resource extraction, uh, and environmental concerns. So you're right, I think uh, there, are, uh, there are countries there and not all of them, but all of them are looking for opportunities. So I think we have to find ways, working throughout the whole of government, the uh, Department of Commerce and others, and to be able to find ways and find solutions where we can deliver at the point of need. Uh, how, has, how has that negative experience over some years now with Belt and Road affected our friends' willingness to uh, initiate other um, projects um, assisted by Belt and Road. 
So I think our, our partners look at us from a standpoint, from mill to mill, they're, they're solid. They want to work with us. They want to be with us. There are some nations, as, as you look are at they, from, but But Admiral, are they, are they beginning to be reluctant to accept China's help because of the negative practices so far? Yes, sir. All right. Let, let me just ask you one other thing. Um, the, President Xi has told his Congress in China that they need to be prepared to, um, to retake Taiwan by 2027. If that occurs, what can we expect China to be doing in your area as that occurs? Uh, Senator, as the deputy commander, I've been a chance to, I've been around for 18 months, 19 months now, and I'll share with you that we continue to uh, work to, in accordance with the, our guidance, to prepare you know, to defend the Panama Canal and make sure we can provide our best military advice to the uh, Sec Defense Chairman, and that's what we'll do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Wicker. Uh, Senator Shaheen, please. Thank you. Congratulations to both of you, and thank you to both of you for your service and to your families for their service as well, um, and welcome. General Nordhaus, I really appreciated your time in my office this week. As you know, I'm very concerned about the National Guard Bureau's decision to level personnel at the 157th Air Refueling Wing at Pease Air Guard Base in New Hampshire. I believe this was a short-sighted decision, that it was done with consideration to neither the capacity of the 157th in New Hampshire, nor the need of the KC-46 to meet its global refueling requirements. And just to give you some background on the 157th, I assume you know all of this, but I think it's worth repeating. The 157th was the first Air National Guard unit to receive the KC-46 refueling tanker. They were selected because of their success and operations and their strategic location. It was the first refueling wing in the country to achieve initial operating capacity of the five active duty guard and reserve wings flying the KC-46. They were the first air refueling wing to conduct a long range exercise and for that they received recognition from top Air Force leadership. And now they are the first KC-46 air refueling wing in the entire Air Force to deploy the KC-46 overseas. I was just in New Hampshire on Sunday as we discussed. I addressed the 300 airmen and women about to deploy. They are excited about this milestone, but they are unfortunately very worried about what the releveling would mean for their ability to do their jobs. This decision, I think, is problematic not just for New Hampshire, but for the KC-46 to meet its operational requirements globally. The proposed leveling will reduce, will cause a reduction in force at Pease by 12 full-time positions. It will revert 22 positions from full-time active guard reserve to technician, resulting in the loss of experienced maintainers and aviators. The guard projects its ability to support transcom will decrease by 23%. And this at a time when we know that aerial refueling capacity is among the top concerns for strategic command and transportation command. We heard that from their commanders um, before this committee. In the context of the national defense strategy, as you were just discussing with the chair and ranking member, aerial refueling will be necessary to resupply U.S. forces in the Indo-Pacific. So if confirmed, I hope you will visit New Hampshire with the um, you will meet with the 157th, and you will um, provide an opportunity to look at the importance of their mission to an exemption for this policy. I know that that has been done in some other states, in Alaska, because of the critical mission that they operate, and I believe that you will find that that's the case in New Hampshire as well. Will you commit to, to doing that and looking at the whole releveling issue with respect to New Hampshire and the 157th? Senator, <clears throat> thank you for the question and for uh, being on the National Guard Caucus. Uh, the 157th also, I'll just throw out, you named a lot of great things that the 157th is doing. Currently, as the NORAD Continental Region Commander, they also support uh, 
air refueling for POTUS support and other things across the United States. So I understand the great capability. Uh, understand that uh, General Hokinson said that any state that had a concern um, that uh, he would consider a one-year uh, exemption. Uh, my understanding is P. Uh, uh, New uh, Hampshire asked for that, and that's been uh, granted. He also uh, uh, said that uh, they conduct an assessment. It's my understanding that Air National Guard within the next couple of weeks will visit New Hampshire. Uh, if confirmed, uh, I do promise to make sure we take a full uh, transparent look at this and to make sure that we're meeting mission requirements with full-time uh, requirements. And uh, I look forward to uh, visiting uh, the P's uh, 157th, if confirmed, and look forward to giving this my full attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to submit for the record the assessment that we have done, that the National Guard has done on what the impact would be of that releveling in New Hampshire. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shereen. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, General. Welcome, Admiral. Good to see you. Admiral Holsey, I share your concern about the growing influence of China in some countries within Southcom's AOR. If confirmed, how would you continue or bolster efforts to ensure that the United States is going to be viewed as a partner of choice? Senator, as I uh, look at the way forward of confirm, I think our strength lies in our security cooperation. I think we continue to do the security cooperation. And then under that uh, level, that we have several levers we can use, state partnership program, uh, the uh, humanitarian assistance program, a joint exercise program, which is a very powerful tool. Today, right now, we have the uh, UNITAS ongoing, uh, 24 nations serving a ship side by side, F-18s, uh, ships, uh, submarines. So we're doing real world ops right now. And what that does, it provides the training, interoperability, uh, trust, and confidence in our partners. So that's something that we can do and we continue to do. So I think we'll continue to work on the security cooperation and again, again, whole of government approach, diplomacy in the lead, and then make sure we integrate those efforts with uh, uh, the economic and military as well. This committee, we consistently hear that we have to uh, be more effective in a whole of government approach, especially when we're trying to engage with our partners. If confirmed, can you give me some specific examples uh, with how you would work maybe with the Department of State, uh, with the Department of Commerce, any other agencies that are out there so that we can become uh, even better partners in Latin America? Yes, sir. Right now, I think, I think you need your mic on. The civilian deputy at U.S. Southern Command is actually a, an ambassador. Uh, she served in Guyana, so she's there in our office right now. We have Department of Commerce, LNO, in our, in our, uh, one of our 13 LNOs we have in our command. So there's avenues to reach in and, and utilize our talents, and we have to do that. I think uh, when we convene our conferences, uh, Chief of Mission Conference, we bring all the ambassadors uh, to Southcom, and we invite, invite all the uh, Department of State Commerce and have these discussions. That's how we learn about the great opportunity with XM Bank by inviting uh, the uh, president down to the conference. So we'll continue to look for those avenues to understand better what, what options we have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, General, uh, we look at a significant amount of total force logistics and airlift capability, and we know that that resides with our National Guard in a potential conflict, especially with a peer adversary, especially when one um, is when one may happen with uh, limited notification, limited uh, warnings to our country, National Guard forces are gonna have to really mobilize quickly. What do you see as opportunities to increase integration and collaboration with the total force, especially in terms of planning and exercise so that we can have a uh, much quicker uh, deployment? Senator, over the last uh, decade, I've really seen an incredible integration of the National Guard with uh, all operations across the Army and the Air Force. Uh, as we look at uh, um, transformation that's going on with the Army and uh, optimizing for great power competition in the United States Air Force, our National Guard on both sides are fully integrated into their plans. And then as we do exercises, large scale uh, exercises, as we prepare for that type of uh, 
conflict uh, if it were to come. I think we're well integrated across the board. If confirmed, I will work with General George and General Alvin to make sure that we continue that and make sure that we're always ready and always there and we can mobilize quickly to meet the needs of our nation. You know, we've heard uh, this morning the, the state partnership program. It's been mentioned a, a couple times. The Admiral just, just did that. Uh, do you see um, opportunities out there that we can continue to build upon this program? I know, I believe that most states are involved in it. Nebraska has a couple of uh, partners. And uh, I know that our Guard feels that that's a valuable program, uh, not, not just for our country, but in, in the countries that we serve with as well. Any opportunities out there to grow this? Absolutely, uh, Senator. Uh, we will work with uh, combatant commands uh, to make sure that uh, we take a look at uh, all the uh, opportunities that are out there and through the State Department. Uh, we recently just added Finland and Sweden, and so we will continue to uh, look at that program. I think it is the incredible asymmetric uh, capability of our nation with our allies and partners uh, to be uh, that great force for our nation and for freedom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to the witnesses for your nominations. Uh, General Nordhaus, I don't want to begin where Senator Fisher left off on the state partnership program. Virginia has a partnership with Tajikistan that goes back to 2003, and we're very proud that this year we formed an additional state partnership with Finland, um, The uh, um, Finland joining NATO. Uh, combines nicely with the fact that we're standing up a NATO command in Norfolk to focus on the North Atlantic and the Arctic. And Finland as a state partnership, uh, as a state partner, I think will be a very valuable one for us. So I just want to encourage the work that uh, you will continue to do when you are confirmed to strengthen these programs and look at the way the state partnership programs can evolve to help us face challenges of the future. I have a very specific question for you, General Nordhaus. The blended retirement system was developed in the 2016 NDAA to include incentives like mid-career continuation pay to encourage retention. Talk a little bit about how the National Guard has been impacted by this new system, and is there anything additional Congress can do to provide support uh, for National Guard members through programs like blended retirement? Senator, thanks for the question and the comments on the state partnership program. Um, as we look at our, our National Guard and we continue to see uh, really high retention rates, uh, I think that's one of the things that we'll have to continue to look at to see what impacts a blended retirement system has. Uh, as I said in my uh, opening uh, statement and talked about uh, with the chairman, people are my number one priority. And so we have to understand uh, what they need, what the requirements are to make sure that they're organized, trained, equipped to be able to do the mission, but they also have uh, the appropriate uh, pay and benefits uh, to make sure that uh, the National Guard is a great place to work and then have that in longevity. I, I, under, I understand going forward we're gonna, we need to assess that all the time. Do you have a kind of, this has been in place for a couple of years, do you have a sense for how it's working? I mean, are we too hot, too cold, just right, or um, how, how would you assess it thus far? Senator, my early assessment from my time, I, I haven't seen a significant change. But uh, if confirmed, I will definitely uh, make that something I'll take a look at to understand uh, the impacts. If I see anything negative, I'll, I'll be sure to come back to the committee. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Admiral Holsey, I chair the uh, America's subcommittee on Senate Foreign Relations, and I'll pick up on some questions and line of inquiry from Senator Wicker. He was asking you whether partners in the Americas are uh, seeing or, or developing skepticism based upon some of their interactions with uh, China, and I think you're right that the answer is yes, and yet what I hear when I travel in the region is, but you can't beat something with nothing. They may put, you know, deals on the table that could trap us in debt. They may want to do development projects that will be performed in a substandard way. Sometimes those projects are performed with Chinese workers, not workers from the countries in question. There are environmental challenges. They're worrying about data security. I hear that everywhere. And yet they usually conclude by saying, and yet they are putting significant investments on the table that they're willing to do. And they don't necessarily see the same uh, attention um, resources from the United States. If you, if you include U.S. private company investment, and we should always talk about that as part of what we do, then it equalizes a little bit more. But they, uh, they tend to see China coming with a checkbook that's nearly 
you know, blank checks that they're willing to fill in whatever the number is, and they don't really see that from us. And some of the programs that we have, frankly, for nations in the Americas, as soon as they achieve some level of success, like a Costa Rica or Dominican Republic, we say, well, now you're a well-off nation, and so these programs can't serve you anymore. I think we need to do an awful lot more to uh, help those nations in the Americas that are allies, who are successful, to succeed even more. And what they often say to us is, as soon as we're successful, you don't pay attention to us and you spend your time on the headaches. Obviously, we need to spend some time on the headaches, but I think we're getting out, out competed in the Americas, and that's my sense. Um, General Richardson, I think, did a wonderful job. I know you and she have worked closely together in, in strengthening uh, the mill-to-mill -mill partnerships, but it does need to go uh, beyond that. So if you could, maybe share with the committee what risks do we assume as a country if we fail to devote the necessary resources, military or otherwise, and attention to the challenges we're seeing in Latin America? Uh, thank you, Senator. Just one uh, uh, quick uh, thing I'll share. When you look at the 5G standpoint, and so from 5G, if you have a Huawei system or a PRC system, now our, our partners have that data and security. It was connected to your, your network system now how do you continue to work with us, right? So we're trying to make sure we have opportunities and options to, for them, and we just have to move a whole lot faster. Yes, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Senator Cain. Senator Cotton, please. Thank you. Gentlemen, congratulations on your nominations, and congratulations and thank you uh, to your families and your mentors and the NCOs across the course of your career who brought you to this point. Uh, General Nordhaus, obviously the National Guard plays a very critical role for our nation. We see them at home responding to natural disasters or crises, uh, but we also rely on them for our national security. As some of the other senators have said about their National Guard, uh, the Arkansas National Guard was just last year in Germany providing critical support and training to Ukraine's armed forces where I visited with them. And just next week, we'll have a ribbon cutting ceremony at Ebbing Air Force Base for the new foreign training mission for the F-35. Um, these are very vitally important, not just for the Arkansas National Guard, but also for our nation's security. And, and I know that I have your commitment to support that just as much as your predecessors have, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, support those important programs that you talked about. Thank you. Um, I, I want to turn to an issue that's kind of at the intersection of your current role at, at NORAD and, and that might be uh, in your role at the National Guard Bureau. Um, you're familiar, obviously, with the high tempo of drone incursions over our military installations, um, not just in places like Iraq and Syria, but here in the United States to include National Guard bases. Uh, what's your view of the National Guard's role in defending installations and domestic infrastructure from such drone incursions? Senator, uh, you raise an important issue. Uh, counter small UAS and uh, protecting our bases is absolutely vital. Uh, we are seeing uh, increased uh, uh, incursions uh, through uh, Nord Northcom uh, Commander General Guillo, uh, which sets the force protection across the United States. Uh, bases uh, have that responsibility to uh, defend and secure their um, and protect their bases. Uh, the same would be for the National Guard in, in the bases. And so I'd work whole of government approach and certainly with uh, the services that has taken this uh, issue very seriously and on weekly uh, meetings to make sure we get after the problem. Okay. Um, do you have the relevant authority you need right now to support DHS and DOJ when we see drone incursions violating U.S. airspace controls over U.S. military installations? Senator, authorities are different in the United States than they are overseas. And so I know General uh, Guillo, uh, Nor Northcom, as the synchronizer uh, for the Department of Defense, Certainly looking at those and working those authorities to make sure uh, if additional ones are needed that that's brought forward. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we have the right capability, both either kinetic or non-kinetic, uh, to understand and domain awareness so that we can sense uh, the incursions and then that we have the problem set right and the authorities uh, to use whatever ever needed to protect our people and our equipment. Thank you. A any thoughts on what you might do if confirmed about the long-term procurement and sustainment uh, of capabilities needed for a homeland counter drone mission? Oh, for the counter drone, uh, drone mission. Uh, yes, Senator, we'll work with our services who are the procurement authority. So I'll certainly work with General Alvin and General George as we look forward to the best way to uh, defend our bases and, and protect our people. Okay, thank you. 
Admiral Halsey, I want to talk a little bit about Haiti. Um, there's a current UN plan of the multinational security support mission to deploy around 2,500 personnel to Haiti, mostly from Kenya and Benin, but also some Caribbean nations. Uh, I have to say this strikes me as a totally harebrained scheme. Uh, Port-au-Prince, for instance, has 1.2 million people. It's overrun by gangs and militias, and it lacks a functioning government. Um, I, I know that in your current role or your future role, you don't shape policy as it relates to Haiti. But I, I do want to know from your military expertise and your role as the current deputy commander in Southcom, what do you think is the prospect of success for a force of 2,500 personnel to stabilize a uh, city of 1.2 million people without an effective government? Senator, thanks for that question. As I look at the current layout, right now we're planning for approximately uh, 1,000 at this point is what we're looking at. Uh, so it's a very challenging problem set, right? But I will share with you as I look at uh, at least one metric, uh, right now we have the uh, about 350, almost 380 or so uh, Kenyans on the ground. When I look at the number of Haitians coming through the Darien, I've seen that number trending down for the last couple of months. I think that's somewhat sending a signal to at least the Haitians that they're willing to wait and see how this plays out. But it will be a, a very challenging problem set, sir. Yeah, I think it'll be challenging as well. And what concerns me most is there's a, a fairly long history of our interventions or the UN's interventions in Haiti, and they don't have a very good good end stories, especially the United Nations and what some of its officials have done in Haiti. Um, I just worry very much that other nations are biting off more than they can chew uh, under a harebrained UN scheme, and where are they gonna turn in a crisis? They're gonna turn to you and to the United States and our personnel, and, and we might end up in a situation where we have to put American forces at least into the ports to help evacuate people. And I think that would be very, very unwise for our nation. So I, I agree that 2,500 troops or even a few more than that is unlikely to do much in Haiti and puts our own personnel potentially at great risk in the future. Thank you. Sir. Congratulations both. Sir. Thank you very much, Senator Cotton. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Halsey. You're serving in a war zone. Since we've been sitting here this morning, 10 Americans have died as a result of the work in that war zone. I'm talking about overdose deaths, over 100,000 in the country, almost one a day in my state of Maine. Americans are dying, and here's what's the problem, or a problem, a part of the problem. We are only interdicting 25% of the drug shipments by sea that are coming to this country that we know of, that intelligence tells us are coming and where they are, and yet 75% of them get through. That's inexcusable. There's, there's something crazy about that. We're talking about perspective issues with other countries in the region. This is, this is a real live war zone where people are being killed. And I just don't understand it. This, is, this has been going on for years. I've been asking this question. So I want to understand why we're able to only interdict 25% of the drug shipments that we know about. And if it's a lack of ships, let's find them. The Navy, the Coast Guard, neighboring countries. How about this? The boats that we do interdict, let's get the people off and the drugs off and turn them into arm them, and then they can be part of the fleet to interdict other shipments. But we've got to think creatively about this. I'm tired of coming to this hearing every, every couple of years and hearing this same figure of 25% interdiction of what we know of. Will you commit to me to do two things? Number one, to look for the resources and the assets that are necessary to execute this mission. And number two, to look at the organization of the mission. There are lots of U.S. government agencies involved, intelligence, DHS, drug interdiction, Navy, Coast Guard. My sense is nobody's in charge. And I'd like you to come back to this committee with an organizational chart that, show that shows that somebody is in charge. And I never like to hear the phrase all of government. Every time I hear that phrase, what I hear is nobody's in charge. Will you make those two commitments, Admiral?
Senator, I understand your concern, and even one life is precious. And uh, so it doesn't matter how many, right? One is, one is precious. I will share with you that um, I commit to looking at this very closely. I believe that uh, we have uh, areas that we can improve. I will advocate for adequate uh, resourcing area maritime assets to bolster our presence and to be able to affect uh, interdictions. I think we have to do that. Uh, we have to continue to work with intelligence as well. As well. But again, it's a very challenging problem set. Uh, we will continue to support the uh, lead federal agency, the DEA. We, again, we have all those re resources, but, but if, now we have to bring them together. But if you don't have the assets, if you don't have those ships, let us know. That's the business that we're in. Let us know so sure. that we can try to solve this problem. But I want you to, as you're flying back today, bear in mind that one American every five minutes, 24 hours a day, is dying. Yes, sir. As a result of this crisis. General, uh, congratulations on your appointment. I should have said that to you as also Admiral Halsey. Um, we want KC-146s at Bangor at the 101st Air Fueling Wing. And I hope that that's going to be on your list. Uh, that's, as you know, during the Gulf War, during anything that's going on in Europe, Ukraine, the 101st Air, Air Refueling Wing is critical because what they work is the North Atlantic. So will you commit to me that, that they will get a good, close, serious consideration for the next round of deployment of KC-46s? Senator, uh, like you raised, the KC-46 and, uh, is an incredible uh, platform for us. Uh, I also visited uh, Bangor up there within the last uh, um, six months or so, and so you have an incredible unit up there. Uh, certainly with the uh, um, states that, uh, and opportunities for KC-46, uh, that'll be a very um, critical process um, that we're going through right now. Um, Certainly, um, all the states that uh, have the opportunity, I believe there's 15 of them, uh, will have a, a full look uh, with the criteria that's been uh, acknowledged by the states, um, also uh, approved by the wing commanders in the tags, and then that'll come up through a, a process and be open and transparent um, for that. Thank you. I was going to suggest you could, when, as you visit Bangor, you could visit Pease by flying over it on the way to Bangor. I suggested that to <laughs> Senator Shaheen. Uh, quick note, a lot of people have mentioned partnerships, these international partnerships. We have one with Montenegro, very <laughs> successful. We came to their defense in 2022 mm -hmm. on a cyber incident. It made a huge difference for them. I'm very proud of, of our uh, cyber warriors in Maine, as well as the maniacs of the 101st. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Chairman, uh, Senator Worker, I yielded back 14 seconds earlier. I, I wonder if I could ask Admiral Halsey, what do we do with those boats that we seize and interdict? And so, what do you think about that suggestion? So actually, actually, sir, uh, we actually do seize boats. In fact, uh, part of our, um, our uh, Jet of South and as well as our NAV South um, hybrid fleet, we're using some of these boats as uh, drones, as targets, and so we do that. Do that, and then if it's unseaworthy, uh, then the the ship generally sinks it or scuttles it if it's not seaworthy afterwards. I, I think it's a, a worthwhile suggestion that Senator King has made. Thank you, Senator Worker. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Scott, please. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, congratulations on your nominations. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, Thank you for the sacrifice of your families. So uh, I'm from Florida, so we, we follow closely what's going on in Latin America. Um, so you can look at Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Colombia, look at all these places, even some issues that are going on in Brazil. So Emma Halsey, so let's, let's take Venezuela. Um, Maduro's trying to steal the election. I'm very disappointed the Biden and Harris administration won't, won't uh, recognize Gonzalez as the president-elect. The election was clearly stolen. Uh, we're still fighting to make sure um, that Maduro leaves power. Uh, so what, if Maduro doesn't leave power, what concerns do you have? Uh, what will happen in Venezuela and how does it impact our national security? So Senator, I understand your concern. I think uh, if Maduro doesn't leave, I think the instability will continue. Uh, the economy has worsened uh, since uh, 2013. You had over eight million migrants uh, leave, the, leave the country. Uh, you've had the economy, there's a lack of food, water supply, services. So again, I see a potential where the 
mass migration continues or the, through the Durian. And uh, if confirmed, I'll continue to work with the, my allies and partners in the region to try to mitigate the instability caused by the migration. So communist China, our communist uh, regime in Cuba, do you think they're a national security threat to the United States? I think right now, uh, Senator, the, um, the, in Cuba, as I think they're being um, uh, supported by both Russia and the China uh, from a security uh, cooperation deep in their, their relationship with them. And if confirmed, I continue to uh, make sure we remain keenly aware of any defense cooperation, intelligence collection, or military deployments, and make sure I can uh, provide options as required. Do you believe Colombia is a trusted military partner? Uh, in my uh, 18, uh, 19 months in the job now, uh, I see no reason why they're not. I think they're very engaged with us. Uh, they're taking losses every day. They're in the fight against the TCOs, and they're looking for our support, and I think we need to continue to support them. Does it concern you that they, uh, the Petro has uh, alliances with Cuba, uh, with Maduro, and with Communist China? Uh, right now, uh, sir, my, from my standpoint, I really work with the uh, military. I think uh, kind of a bigger DOD or a bigger policy question, but I think our role as a, as a military organization, uh, in alignment with the uh, military uh, folks, we have to make sure that stays pretty tight, and we, I'll continue to do that. Free speech is under assault in Brazil after it banned the use of X, which is blatant censorship of the Brazilian people by the socialist Lula government. What challenges do restrictive censorship policies like these have on our ability to maintain productive U.S. military relationships? I think right now, uh, Senator, uh, the relationship we have with the, at least the military is, is pretty solid. And they've supported us and we continue to support them. Uh, even when they visit us, they still talk about when they supported us in World War II. Uh, I think uh, they're there as uh, reliable, trusted partners from Brazil. I think we should support them as well. Uh, clearly, uh, I think from a, a Department of State, uh, interagency standpoint, whole of government, we take a look at policies restricting uh, uh, free speech. Emma Halsby, many civilians work at Southcom, and we have an election uh, coming up around the corner. If one of those civilians was found to have violated the Hatch Act, how would you hold them accountable? I would hold them accountable, sir. What would you do? Uh, well, they have it investigated improperly. Yeah. Could I ask both of you what, the, what you think the importance of Homestead Air Force Base is? Yes, sir. The, uh, currently, from a Southcom perspective, uh, it's a, uh, a solid resource for us. Uh, we use it in our recent uh, Haiti operations. Uh, we've used it in, in exercises. It's the home of our SOC South headquarters, which is our uh, headquarters that uh, a component, head component for our BPRC. So uh, we like uh, their location and what they're doing for us. Yeah. And Senator, from uh, my current uh, position for uh, Kona, our first Air Force, uh, certainly they do a roll uh, down from Homestead uh, with the aerospace control alert. Uh, they're an incredible uh, unit uh, down there with the 125th that uh, flies uh, out of Homestead at times. Uh, so it's very important to us. All right, thanks. Admiral, Admiral Hosley, the, um, how, um, do you need more assets? Uh, going back to what Senator King brought up, um, you know, do you have the assets? I mean, the, the, you know, what, what surprises me is we spend all this money in the Middle East and all over the world, and we, we, it seems like we treat you guys like a stepchild when we have all these issues going on in Latin America. So, Senator, we are, we are a posture limited theater. I think we're working with the assets we have. Uh, but again, if confirmed, I would take a look at our current mission set and look to, uh, and I'll certainly ask for more assets. I need them uh, going forward. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here and uh, for uh, all your work uh, and service to our country. We appreciate you. Uh, General Nordhaus, uh, I want to first off just thank you. Thank you for coming to the office uh, yesterday. We had uh, an opportunity to discuss a variety of issues, and I, I appreciated uh, that opportunity. Uh, and as we discussed uh, at length yesterday, uh, Selfridge uh, uh, Air National Guard Base uh, in Michigan, uh, which I know you're very familiar with and you've actually flown in and out of uh, as a fighter pilot, uh, is uh, the largest Air National Guard base in the country. Uh, it has very unique base operational mission requirements uh, and uh, is the sole host uh, requiring additional personnel. And to, to be clear, it's, it is like an active duty base. Uh, it's not uh, an Air National Guard facility that shares a civilian airfield and is a part of it. It is the airfield. It is the base. It really is, uh, for all intents and purposes, an active duty base, the only one in the Air National uh, Guard system. 
Uh, but I'm very concerned uh, about some potential personnel decisions uh, at Selfridge, uh, indicating that the base is going to lose up to 117 full-time civilians, including uh, 15 contracting personnel. So my question for you, uh, General, is uh, if confirmed, uh, I understand you have the authority to pause uh, these cuts. And can I get your commitment that you will pause these personnel cuts until an independent third party manpower study comparing Selfridge personnel needs to active duty bases, not the other Air National Guard bases that are adjacent to a civilian airfield and share those facilities, but like an active duty base, would you commit to having that independent third party study so we're doing, we're really truly comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges? Senator, like you said, uh, I'm from uh, Toledo, so uh, my time uh, up in that area has been uh, incredible, and to see uh, Michigan and Selfridge, so I've been there many times. I understand the base very well. Certainly want, want to work with your team, if confirmed, to go back and forth to make sure that we can get to right and what uh, that looks like. And if we can't get to an agreement that uh, what the appropriate thing to do is, uh, I certainly uh, you have my commitment to uh, look at a third party to make sure that uh, we can look at all the numbers to make sure that we meet mission to requirements and take care of our people in the mission. Uh, and I know how critical it is up in the state of Michigan. Well, that's wonderful. That's great. I'll, I'll look forward, if confirmed, for working with you and your commitment today that if, uh, if necessary to have a third party, having a fresh set of eyes looking at it, you're open to that. Uh, yes, sir. I'm definitely open to that. Great. Thank you. Uh, also, General Nurhaus, uh, last month, uh, more than 6,300 military personnel from 32 states, uh, as well as many uh, key allies and partners gathered in Michigan at the National All-Domain Warfighting Center uh, during uh, Exercise uh, Northern Strike. Uh, this exercise allows participants uh, to hone their expeditionary, sustainment, and joint integrated fires uh, training. And year, year after year, uh, more and more units uh, request uh, to join this uh, truly premier a training event uh, in, a, in an amazing place in northern uh, Michigan. So, General, given uh, this increasing demand, uh, how do you envision expanding Northern Strike during uh, your tender? And will you commit to working with me to expand both active duty as well as reserve components, uh, as well as our allies and partners uh, to be a presence at Northern Strike to fully utilize this facility and its outstanding uh, training capabilities uh, that exist there? Senator, uh, likewise, I've flown out of Alpena many times. Uh, I understand the incredible airspace and uh, all the opportunities around there to include grayling in the other areas. Uh, certainly doing these large scale exercises are critical to how we get after great power competition. Uh, you have my commitment that uh, I will do everything I can to make sure that we stay after uh, the capabilities that we need to be interoperable uh, and integrated with our joint partners, allies and partners in with, in, with the joint team. Great, good to, good to hear that, General. And my last question, General, as we, as we discussed uh, yesterday in my office, uh, uh, I remain committed to securing a future fighter replacement mission for our retiring uh, A-10 fighter jets that are currently uh, at Selfridge. Uh, I know you share my concerns uh, about deactivating uh, the, fire, uh, the fighter squadron. Uh, and the resulting uh, degradation of uh, Air Guard and Air Force uh, readiness as a result of that. Uh, Selfridge Air Guard pilots have, uh, as you're well aware, a wealth of uh, experience which will be lost, will be lost if the Air Force does not recapitalize uh, their fighter mission. So my question for you, General, as an experienced fighter pilot uh, with over 3,000 flight hours, can you share uh, with me the, and the committee, the value of Selfridge's uh, Air Guard fighter pilots and their experience uh, and how necessary that is for the total force. Senator, certainly uh, when we see times of pilot shortages and maintenance shortage uh, and the capabilities of fighters to meet the global demand from our combatant commands, uh, I want to work with General Alvin. Uh, to make sure that we get after the right fight, uh, fighter force structure across the Air Force and in the Air National Guard. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Tovereau, please. Chairman, uh, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Congratulations. Thanks for your service and your sacrifice, lifetime of sacrifice. Uh, both of you have done a great job. Uh, General, uh, do you have any numbers on recruiting in National Guard over the last couple of years? Senator, uh, 
As I uh, prepped uh, for the hearing to get with both the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard, that was one of my questions was where are they at and this year for meeting and strength. Uh, it's my understanding from them that they're both going to miss it by roughly about 700 to 800. Uh, my understanding also is that they've turned the corner coming out of the uh, global pandemic where they weren't able to get into schools and other things where they normally recruited from. So they're starting to see uh, great positivity there. The future Army soldier preparatory course that the Army has done is my understanding. The Army has brought in 25,000, and I believe 4,500 of those are going into the Army National Guard. Uh, production recruiters, finding assistance, uh, ways to help the production recruiters get after recruiting back in the schools, getting uh, to junior uh, colleges and those things. Uh, I'm committed, if confirmed, from my time at the readiness center where every day I was focused on recruiting and retention because we have to hire the best and then we have to organize and train them, equip them to do our uh, nation's capabilities for uh, wartime and peacetime. Yeah, I think it's so important because we're not reaching our goals in, in full-time military and I think it's very important for us to, you know, fill up or even exceed what we do in recruiting in National Guard. Would you agree? I would agree, Senator. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Admiral, spent some time uh, down in Panama uh, last uh, couple of years, done a little research. Uh, we're fortunate to have a new president there in Molino. Uh, he thinks like we do. Uh, he, he wants us and to have more presence there uh, uh, with the, I don't know, uh, the, what I've looked at and, and studied, uh, one, probably one of the most asinine decisions is us fully pulling out of the Panama Canal. Uh, you know, since 1999 in the early, making that decision in the early 80s, uh, just talking to people down there, they're, they're hurting economically. And when you're in that point, you're very vulnerable to Russia, China. China had their foothold in till we got this president in down there. We need to make a, uh, and I know you understand this, we, ne we need to be able to hold on to the Panama Canal because as what we're hearing, uh, if something were to happen in the Pacific, how in the hell are we going to get things to the Pacific, uh, especially from the East Coast, if we've got to go all the way down to the bottom of, of uh, South America and not be able to go through the Panama Canal of China, if China were to be able to uh, block that thing off or do something, damage it or whatever. Um, you agree with that? Uh, yes, Senator. Yeah. The, uh, the problem that they're having down there, again, is uh, do you have, uh, you being the deputy, uh, how many people do we actually have down in the Panama area that helps with the Panamanians with the canal, or do we have any uh, input at all with it? Yes, sir. We generally have our our, uh, our SFAB teams, which are really uh, advise and assist teams uh, down there. Uh, but I was sure if you just recently, we just completed Panamax, a Panamax exercise where we had uh, hundreds of troops working together, uh, maritime assets, aviation assets, ground assets. And again, that builds that, comp that oper oper interoperability and that uh, trust and confidence to kind of take on uh, malign actors. So again, and plus it sends a strong signal that we're working together as a team. So we have to continue to do those type of actions. Yeah, I'd really love to see this president come up and visit with our, our people in the White House and the Pentagon, uh, because I think this is a huge national security issue if we don't take care of it with this president, because it could change uh, very quickly, you know, if they have another regime changes, uh, the, their economy is really, really struggling. To another point, uh, tell me about the cell drone uh, that we use uh, in the Caribbean and in your AOR. Uh, what, do you think that they're adequate and they're doing the job that they need to do? Yes, sir. I like to thank the Navy. I think uh, last year, a couple of years, we got a chance to bring cell drones uh, to our hybrid fleet. Uh, it's a new uh, process by the Navy to actually get after with our limited assets. And one thing the partners are always ask for is maritime domain awareness. So these uh, cell drones, we've been able to use them from an ex uh, experimental standpoint and operational, and they're showing promise. So I think we have to continue to work and utilize, how, figure out how we can use them uh, more so into our uh, scheme, but we do have them located throughout the AR. Yes, Were sir. they used when the Russians brought their ships in, the submarines? Uh, I can uh, I can talk to you later, sir. Uh, I think it's uh, but it's a great opportunity. They can uh, we've used them operationally. Yes, yeah. Sir. How many do we have in the Caribbean? It, you know, do we have a dozen, yeah. two dozen? L less than a dozen, sir. Yeah. Okay. You need more? Uh, yes, sir. We could use more. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tellerville. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Admiral General. Congrats on your nominations, um, uh, General uh, Senator Peters. 
asked a question about that was very specific to Selfridge Air Force Base and recapitalization of the fighter jets there. Um, we, I led a, uh, some language in the uh, fiscal year 25 uh, Senate NDAA on fighter force preservation and recapitalization, which would require the Secretary of the Air Force to come up with a plan and then implement a plan to sustain and recapitalize all 25 fighter squadrons in the Air National Guard. So what do you think is the, uh, the right balance between modernization and, and keeping our fourth gen fighters? Senator, from my time as being the director of ops for the National Guard and sitting on ops steps, uh, it was uh, great to see the capability not only uh, across the Air Force and in the National Guard, but uh, the requirements ac across the globe uh, for fighter demand. Um, if confirmed, I want to work with uh, General Alvin uh, to make sure that we understand uh, what that right balance is between 4th gen and 5th gen uh, to make sure that we can be there uh, not only for the combat commands, uh, but also for homeland defense. And what kind of weight do you give uh, like a conflict in the Western Pacific compared to uh, European theater when making these kind of decisions? Senator, as we look at uh, China, Certainly, they're trying to gain advantage uh, in land, air, sea, uh, cyber, and space. And so uh, over in the indo pacom theater, uh, China is our pacing threat. And so we want to make sure that we have the right capabilities. And fifth gen uh, can be balanced with fourth gen and other things that the Air Force is working. So once again, I want to, if confirmed, want to work with General Alvin to get after that problem set. All right. Thank you, General. Uh, Admiral, uh, we are in the midst of uh, global strategic competition with uh, both Russia and China. And China especially continues to influence um, a lot of effort there to influence uh, in the Western Hemisphere, you know, economic engagement uh, that they use to gain access to natural resources and influence in the politics of countries, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, are having uh, an effect. And we can continue to see inroads that China is making in South America. Uh, 22 countries in Southcom have joined the Belt and Road Initiative uh, as China seeks to sign them up for some pretty bad deals and then exploit them for their natural resources. So Admiral, how can we or you, Southcom, highlight to countries in Latin America and South America about the dangers of working with China? <clears throat> Senator, I share your concern. I think we have to continue to um, expose Milan activity as we see it. Uh, that's done uh, a lot by our engagement from the diplomatic standpoint. Uh, when we do our military exercises, our military -mil exchanges, uh, we've been able to, one thing our partners are asking for us now is cyber. So we have been able to go and do uh, uh, joint, uh, joint combat command cyber assess team. So we get, uh, go and, and look at their systems and help them out, cyber hygiene, to ask for space support too. So again, I think it's really a whole of government effort is to kind of show them a lot of activity and make sure our partners are aware of it. And we have to continue to do that uh, with speed. Beyond, beyond cyber, can you uh, talk a little bit about the impact that foreign military sales in Southcom have and the benefits of building strong relationships with our partners uh, in the area uh, in light of the fact that, you know, China often goes in there and gives them some pretty good deals on equipment that uh, is not uh, first rate. So to be clear, our, our partnerships are our best determinants in theater. And again, our major lever as a posture limited theater is the security cooperation. And so via the foreign military sales process, foreign military financing is a key enabler for us. Uh, but it, we have to deliver faster, though. And that's kind of the, the thing we've seen as we kind of go forward as we watch this process for last year. So we're trying to find a ways to uh, deliver quicker to get our partners, uh, meet them at a point of need, to get them the assets they need. But again, they want the maritime domain awareness. They want the cyber. They want the patrol craft. So again, we, if we do that, then we have to deliver so that uh, PRC doesn't have a chance. Is there one country in particular that you're concerned about in you know, their interest in buying PRC military hardware? So they have a lease uh, uh, 
uh, Venezuela's one for sure, Cuba's one for sure as well. But as far as uh, I was happy to see uh, our designs uh, get the F-16 vice, the GF-17, we did not want that in this theater. But again, they're, they're, very, they're very subtle, they engage, and they won't stop. So we have to stay on top of it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that J J-17 issue was one that I've been tracking since I got here, and it is uh, good to see that they'll be uh, flying F-16s instead. Better, better plane for them, too. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Budd, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to see you all again. I enjoyed our conversations earlier and uh, this week in my office. Um, the national defense strategy, it's clear that protecting our homeland is our military's number one priority. And one of the greatest threats to the security of the American people is the crisis at the southern border. Now, uh, as we talked about, although DOD is not the lead federal agency responsible for securing the border or enforcing immigration laws, if confirmed, you'll both play a critical role in stemming the flow of illegal immigration and combating drug cartels, plaguing our country with fentanyl. So General, uh, if confirmed, you would oversee training and mobilization of more than 2,500 National Guardsmen supporting the Customs and Border Patrol at the border. Admiral, if confirmed, you would be responsible for Southcom's efforts to combat transnational criminal organizations profiting from human trafficking and drug trafficking. And that's, that ultimately harms uh, our communities across the country, including communities in my home state of North Carolina. So my question is this, if confirmed, will you both make these efforts a top priority? I'd appreciate a simple yes or no answer. General. Yes, Senator. Admiral. Yes, Senator. Thank you both. Uh, General, in your advanced policy questions, you state that you're proud of the National Guard support of the border mission, their support of it, right? But yet you make it a point that it doesn't add readiness value. Can you help me understand that a little better? Senator, first off, I'd like to thank the committee for uh, the funds that they provide for our counter drug program. Uh, 2,500 of our folks are out there doing and supporting across the United States. And in 2023, $10 billion worth of illegal drugs were taken off the street. So thank you for the efforts on our counter drug program. Um, as we go to the Southwest border, um, we wanna make sure that uh, the, the readiness is not getting added. So while they're on the Southwest border, they're doing advise and insist monitoring. They're in support of Customs and Border Patrol so that they can do their law enforcement uh, along there. They're not back home training for great power competition missions. They're not back home with their families and their employers getting set up so that the next time they're asked to deploy overseas for a combat role that, that they uh, um, have that more uh, spin for, for the National Guard. We've seen a very consistent that our service members uh, continue to be retained at a high level. And so they appreciate the, the deploy to dwell that they have. But every time we send them to another location, it does take them away from their families and from their employers and we can't use them to train for great power competition. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this, uh, General. I think the part that's not said is the emphasis and the need to have strict enforcement of our immigration laws and fully allow Border Patrol to secure a border so that the guardsmen under your watch and care can get back to preparing for potential conflict with our adversaries. Uh, Admiral, uh, earlier this week in my office, we had a great discussion uh, regarding the lengthy and bureaucratic processes that our allies and partners face in the foreign military sales process. So how does the current FMS process hamper efforts uh, with partners in places like Panama, Colombia, uh, that could help those countries stem the flow of migrants, illegal migrants, or combat drug cartels? So, uh, uh, Senator, that... I understand your concern. It's a very uh, uh, long process. Yes. Uh, there, there are a lot of different, uh, as you term, wickets to go through to get the you know, letter of acceptance to go back to the, whether it's a ship or a service the company's going to go to. So it takes a lot of time. And you want to make, make, generally make sure you're checking all the boxes and make sure you get it right. That's part of the, it's just really bureaucracy, right? So again, and uh, partners are waiting for these uh, tools, if they don't get them, then they look elsewhere. So right now, what we're trying to do is working with XM Bank and others to find other ways to deliver quicker. And so again, we had a chief of mission conference uh, this past May, had a chance to bring in the XM Bank uh, president, share that story with the, uh, and how she's willing to help and others uh, avenues to go after uh, things outside the process. And we're seeing some results that we might uh, be able to, to train to and, and get better results over. 
Thank you for that. Uh, would you mind sharing with the committee the example of the maritime patrol aircraft that took personal involvement from General Richardson in order to get it delivered? Yeah, yes, very briefly. I think the, the aircraft have been uh, stalled for over two years. And uh, her first visit with the uh, president, he asked about that aircraft. And she came back and really got personally involved. And three months later or so, the plane was delivered. And uh, she was able to go there, and the president was actually there at the reception, along with some of his cabinet members. So it's a great process if we get it to work. So in closing, I'll ask you this. Uh, if confirmed, Admiral, do you commit to keep the committee updated on similar issues <clears throat> so that we can work together to improve the FMS process? Uh, yes, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bud. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral, I, I have uh, some questions for you. Thank you for being here. Um, you authored the um, controversial, I would say, Task Force One Navy report. Is that right? Yes, I was part of the, uh, the uh, lead there, yes. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions about that. <clears throat> so on page 33, it recommends including a, quote, cultural framework questionnaire tailored to individual minority candidates for the, the Naval Academy. What, what does that mean? So I don't have that in front of me right now, Senator, but I would share that basically what we started looking at was a whole of person uh, criteria to look at uh, uh, young folks and make sure we can open our apps here and look for uh, more talent and uh, use every look the talents of all those willing to serve our nation. So does that mean that there's a different application based on somebody's race? Uh, no, Senator. And to be clear, uh, we are a war fighting organization. Our most fundamental duty is to support and defend the Constitution and to... Uh, support and, and uh, make sure we can take care of the safety and security of American people. That's what we're about. We're war fighters, right? So uh, that's what this uh, process is about, to make sure we can build readiness. Well, I would agree with that. <clears throat> um, on page 40, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm honestly trying to understand what some of these terms mean and how it would apply. Um, I don't think any of this stuff has been implemented yet. Is that right? Most of the uh, results from the Task Force One Navy, Navy report was rolled into the Culture of Excellence campaign. Uh, if you look at the recommendations, there are words like explore, review, and then the Navy took a look at it and they decided what they wanted to use, what they could help to build war fighters. And, uh, and so basically the Culture of Excellence, which is about war fighting, war fighters and the foundation is uh, what's left over now of the Task Force One effort. Okay. On page 40 of that, um, you, met, you recommend that we consider the use of diversity stamps on minority applications. What is a diversity stamp? Actually, that was uh, from before. There used to be a case of diversity stamps. I'm not sure if that was the excerpt recommendation. I don't have it in front of me right now, so. Okay. Um, I guess the, the idea uh, then of a, whether it's in there, I want to make sure I understand if it is, is the idea, what is, what's the, what is the thinking behind a diversity stamp? So, Senator, I will, I will share with you that I'm reminded of the words, uh, pluris unum, out of many one. That's who we are. We're a nation of uh, immigrants. We're a nation of people serving together. There's so many of us today who are looking for opportunities to serve, and they want to serve our nation and do what's best for all of us. And so I think, uh, again, the Navy was looking a way to find out who people were. To be quite um, honestly, after two years in Care Strike Group Command, uh, I was asked to leave this effort. I did not ask for it. I didn't want to do it. Uh, but I think I was selected to do it because of my, my character, my reputation, my professional. Uh, 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 well, listen, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I admire your career, and I, and I really do thank you mm. for your service. I just, my concern is, and, and I, this is not the first time I've asked on this kind of topic when people come before and have been, you know, um, their name has been associated with some of these ideas. I do think it's incredibly divisive, right, to be... Um, whether it's a quota or it's a, um, just dividing the room by immutable characteristics, I just don't think it has anything to do or it has no place in our military. I really don't. And I do think we should be active in reaching out to uh, you know, a broad group of people to serve. I don't disagree with that at all. But you know, when there's things like recommendation 5.4, which is to counter hate speech, um, who, who decides Who's the arbiter of like what's hate speech in this recommendation? That is decided by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Okay. Would um, referring to white people as bubbas be hate speech? 
I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, that's part of the problem. I mean, yeah. Derek Cholette, who's President Biden's nominee to be Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, that's what he said in 2020. So I don't know, is he disqualified? Is that hate speech or not hate speech? So this, this is what I'm getting at. Like, I don't, I don't understand what a lot of these terms even mean, and certainly not how they would be applied. And, you know, you authored this report, so I'm, I'm honestly asking for some explanations about how this would actually work. Again, I think, uh, Senator, the Navy took the report, they looked at it, and they will decide how they want to go forward with it. As I said before, uh, if anything out of it, uh, they wrote it to the culture of excellence 2.0, uh, to look at how to build warfighters. Okay, well, uh, we may follow up with some additional questions on this because I, I don't know what a quality assurance check means. I, I don't, like, um, anyway, uh, I appreciate your service. There's just a lot of questions about this report that I have, which I, I hope you can appreciate. I'm not alone in this. I think um, we need to do everything we can to make sure to ensure that the that the uh, our armed services and our military is the great meritocracy it, it should be, and my concern is that you start dividing people up or, um, you know, this obsession with kind of with race um, is 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 uh, is not good for us. It's certainly not doesn't I don't think gets us further down the road. I think it's hurting recruiting. I, I firmly believe that. So I appreciate your time here today, sir. Thank you, Senator Schmidt. Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, gentlemen. Congratulations on your nomination, both of you and uh, your families as well. So appreciate families being here, being supportive. As I told my wife and daughters, you know, you might not be wearing the uniform, but you're serving. Sometimes harder, harder job than uh, it is for the men and women wearing the uniform. So thank you. Um, General, I want to go into a little bit follow-up on our conversation yesterday in my office. I actually really appreciated that. I thought it was a really good meeting. But um, I want to begin with this, uh, just maybe a little bit of lessons learned from this latest uh, guard, uh, air guard initiative on the PEC leveling, as they called it. Um, my own view is that there was a lot of mistakes that happened, and I want to get your commitment to make sure that you work with this committee and my office and me directly to make sure those mistakes don't happen again. The biggest mistake was the guard at the highest levels didn't check in with the joint force on, hmm, is this initiative we're undertaking gonna impact the readiness of the joint force? That's number one. Um, number two, didn't really kind of, at least from my, as far as I can tell, didn't check in with the committee and then number three, particularly as it relates to the great state of Alaska and our incredible guardsmen uh, there uh, didn't check in with the NORTHCOM commander, ALCOM commander, saying, hey, is this initiative going to impact what these men and women do? So um, what's your thought on that? We had a good discussion. And can you commit to me to make sure that the issues we talked about yesterday don't happen again? It was a big mistake. And... You know, a lot of young men and women were making decisions in my state who had served in the military for a long time to essentially get out. Not good. So can you uh, comment on that and make that commitment to me, sir? Uh, Senator, I can make that commitment to you. <clears throat> Communication and transparency, I think, is the hallmark to make sure that we get out to all the stakeholders and understand uh, points of view from each side. And then we need to communicate that uh, up and back and make sure that we understand any of the implications like you talked about. So you have my commitment, if confirmed, um, to review this in, in whole and to make sure that uh, I communicate back to this committee uh, as required. And to check in with the joint force, the active duty force, correct? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Senator. And that's what I meant by all the stakeholders. So I'm talking okay. about combatant commands, MAGCOMs, the Air Force. Um, Good. Did you hear what happened yesterday in the uh, NORAD region of Alaska last night? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And I uh, was uh, on, on my systems and talking back and forth with uh, General Moore. Okay, good. Just for the chairman's knowledge and this committee's knowledge, we had another Russian uh, bear bomber incursion into the Alaska aid is uh, last night. Uh, this is in addition to um, on July 24th, we had a joint Chinese-Russian strategic bomber task force 
entered the Alaska aid is. That's the first time anywhere in American airspace ever that that's happened. That's an escalation between our two biggest adversaries. Last August, we had a joint Chinese-Russian naval task force of 12 ships. Admiral, I'm sure you're aware of this, off the coast of Alaska. Um, we already had a three-ship Chinese naval task force this summer, Russians uh, naval task force this summer. Um, and of course, the spy balloons that were uh, shot down February 10th of last year. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that, General, is you know what, what unit made it happen that our joint force, both naval but in particularly air assets, could go intercept these Russian and Chinese bombers and send them back to their communist countries and tell them, hey, stay out of our aid is, or maybe you'll get shot down next time? What, what unit made that happen? Uh, sir, that'd be the 168th up at Isleson with their KC-135s. And what kind of unit is that? Uh, it's an Air National Guard unit, sir. Right. So some of the most important missions that are happening in the world today, front lines with great power competition in Alaska are being, there's no way that mission could have happened without the Air National Guard, correct? That's correct, sir. Um, the previous NORTHCOM commander mentioned that these guard member units were operating not at like varsity football, not at varsity college football, but at pro Super Bowl level. That's how good they were in all of these missions that I just mentioned. Would you agree with that? Senators, I'm very proud of all the service members uh, in the Air National Guard, the Army National Guard, and, and the active forces that continue to do this great power competition to make sure we're always ready and always there. Yes, Senator. You can just say they were operating Super Bowl. You know, no one's going to no one's going to hit you up for that one. Wouldn't you agree they were? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, look at their missions. Really, but, really important. Senator, I've flown up in Alaska. I've been up there multiple times. I was just there last time in December. And yes, you have an incredible uh, airman up in Alaska in the one seventy six and the one sixty eight. Let me uh, conclude, Mr. Chairman, with um, just one final question. It's not really a question. It's more of a gift to the two nominees. I was just in Korea on a code L. By the way, I want to compliment the president of Korea, President Yoon. Whenever I've met with him, the number one thing he does, I'm kind of a Korean War history buff, the number one thing he does is he always highlights the heroic actions of uh, American Korean War veterans who saved their country, which they did. If Americans know the history of the Korean War. You know, it's always called the Forgotten War. I hate that phrase because it's kind of a pejorative phrase. The president of Korea doesn't forget about it, right? Our, our service members saved that country, and he acknowledges that every time. I want to thank President Yoon again for his acknowledgement of our Korean War veterans. Many, you know, we don't have a lot left. I have a book that I, one of my favorite books is called This Kind of War. Have either of you read it? Have you read it, General? Uh, no, sir. Have you read it, Admiral? Yes, sir. You have? And I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a copy, anyways. I always give this to our nominees. Um, the reason I do this is a really good book. It's about the Korean War. Most of your peers at the four-star level, general, will have read it. And um, what it describes, though, it describes America. World War II. At the end of World War II, we had the fiercest, most lethal, lethal military in the history of the world. Literally, that's not an exaggeration. By 1950, we had a military that couldn't stop a peasant army from invading South Korea. And it goes into why we lacked readiness. It was uniform and civilian leaders in our military who made horrible decisions. And in the summer of 1950, thousands of young Americans, mostly soldiers, paid the ultimate sacrifice because the leadership of our country at the highest levels of DOD failed. So I'm gonna give this to both of you. I highly recommend you read it. And Admiral, you know, you might wanna skim it or just put it on your bookshelf. Um, but uh, congratulations uh, to both of you. And uh, these are really important um, positions. And I'm gonna follow up with some questions for the record for both of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. I look forward to your confirmations and we'll try to do it with some diligence and speed. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, families, also. Thank you, thank Chairman. Hearing is adjourned.